Welcome back. It's Tom Bell here. So excited to have you here for another episode. I am pumped about this episode and what's to come. Um, so we're talking about all things success, purpose, and passion. And on today's show, I have Michael Croker, head of entertainment, communication coach, host of the Park Life podcast. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's great to be with you. Great to have you here. And look, you know, I, uh, I've seen some super inspirational posts um, scrolling down on my LinkedIn feed. Um, so you've been providing some, some wonderful value there. But for people who haven't yet come across you on their journey, would you mind telling us a bit about yourself? Well, uh, as you mentioned, I'm head of entertainment with Village Roadshow Theme Parks. I've been doing that now for 16 years. Prior to that, I spent five years as head of entertainment with Wonderland Sydney, no longer there, but for a little while was the, the biggest theme park in the Southern Hemisphere. It was this amazing experience for me as a younger man. And then prior to that, I spent 13 years at SeaWorld on the Gold Coast. I started out there as a ride attendant and I would hear these shows happening around me while I was operating the carousel or the wild wave coaster. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good job. You'd hear people screaming and laughing and applauding. And I thought, well, how do I make myself known to that team? And at 18, I became the youngest live show announcer at SeaWorld. And by 25, I was writing show content and coaching mammal trainers and skiers on mic. And away I went and kind of just fell in love with that industry. It's, uh, it's been a labour of love. I still feel as passionate about it now at 52 as I did when I was 18. Oh, that's and incredible. Outside of that, as you mentioned, I do some communication coaching with a business called Stand and Deliver. And so... What I try and do there is short circuit the anxiety that people inherently have about just owning their voice and sitting comfortably under their skin. So I've been that guy as well. And I think I have something to offer with just helping people get out of their own way. So that's mm. kind of me in a nutshell. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's like, you know, when you think about theme parks, I mean, for me, it's probably my own ignorance, but you know that they're there, but you, like, how do people go to be like, are they just applying on seek? And then, so then what is even more amazing is to think that, you know, you've started there, you know, in a base level position and obviously have just theme park um, has been your world for so long in different places, um, but that you have obviously loved it so much. You know, what is it that you love? Is it is it the providing the value for all the people, seeing how people react? Is it is it that bit of the thing that's engaged the things like being on stage and coaching? Like, what is it? What what is it about that world that sort of just kept you so enthralled? Look, it's just two words. It's human connection. It's you're providing people an opportunity to escape the everyday world, and for just a little while, they can lose themselves in in moments and memories and. I genuinely believe it. I'm sitting in my office now at Warner Brothers Movie World, but I don't try and spend too much time just being in this space because this is kind of the what you have to do in order to enjoy the why you do it, which is happening just over that way. Mm. When I get up and walk out of the office and go into the theme park and you see families coming in and children meeting the characters and having moments and you see joy and unbridled joy and you play a role in facilitating a space where that can happen. And, you know, we have a line here that we hardwire memories for people. And that's a great job to have. Yeah, you're not wrong. Like, it's so it's so cool going to theme parks and, and doing those sorts of things. Like the idea of, of being there and, and you see the people on stage and you see that there's so many different gigs and, and people hanging out at the animals. I'm, I'm all for adventure and I've had a, a bucket list that's gotten up to about a thousand. And then I've um, started to reach... Well, it's not just recent, but a point where like I wouldn't probably be able to go on the rides anymore. I think like my brain's just rattling around inside my head. I'd end up probably having to carry around some sort of brown paper bag for for uh, my stomach ejection. Um, so it's just I'm probably more one that would like to watch the shows now. My kids are still too short to probably go on most of the rides. Um, so I'm probably safe for a little bit longer until they ask me, like, Daddy, can you come on this? Um, so, so that is uh, certainly a, a, a very entertaining, uh, you know, idea of what your life has been like. And, and so you also have the podcast. Tell us a little bit about that. What's, what's that about? Well, you know, as I'm sure you'd agree, and you would discover this during, during your own thing here with this particular podcast, everyone is a book. Mm -hmm. And we're either a book in motion or a book that's currently on pause but we're authoring our lives all the time. And so everyone has a story. And with the Park Life podcast, I realised I'm surrounded by people with stories. I'm surrounded by stories. 
uh, from the guy that's working in the cleaning department who's here early in the morning doing his rounds to the chief operating officer who's in an office above me who's got a whole other world of things he's got to do. And what I have been finding and what I expected to find are commonalities in all those different roles and all those different people, whether you're a dancer, whether you're a costume character performer, whether you're an operations manager, you find these common themes running through people and themes of resilience, fearlessness. And that's really what I was hoping to do with the podcast was draw out these common themes that run through people who are authoring their stories in the hope against the backdrop of theme parks that other people listening might find a little bit of inspiration, not dissimilar to what you're doing. It's That's where the reward is when you suddenly start doing enough of them and you hear, ah, there's these common themes that keep coming up in people that have completely different backgrounds, completely different environments that they're, they're working in, but very common themes running through their, their journeys. I find mm. that fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. And and everybody sort of, well, not everybody, but a lot of people play down, you know, what their life is like. And I'm just doing this or I'm just doing that or I'm just the COO or just just the head of entertainment. And, and you know, and, but it's like it, it, whether you're the cleaner or the COO, you, everyone has these amazing stories and they've lived these amazing lives. And yet it's just, it's like it goes on forever untold. Like like a, a tumbleweed, or, you know, that thing, like if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, did, the, did it make a sound? I remember hearing that on The Simpsons. Um, so I think it's a Cohen, but uh, but interesting to think that you know what's it been like for you on the other side of the equation with the the people like whether it's the cleaner or what has it been like for them going in and then getting to come on the show and express their stories have they really enjoyed that? I'll tell you one thing that really struck a chord with me. I interviewed a fellow that works in our team who's involved in creative direction and putting together content for Fright Nights at Movie World and Carnival at Sea World and. Very creative guy, started out working in the retail division as a young person and then worked his way through the system, uh, played a role in the Police Academy stunt show or did all these different things. Anyway, we had a chat and unpacked his life. He told some wonderful stories about his journey and shared a lot of vulnerability. And I don't know, maybe a month later, I was walking through SeaWorld and his son works there and his son is um, only a young man and he walked past me. And he stopped me and he said, oh, Michael, can I have a quick word? I said, yeah, sure. He said, I just wanted to thank you. Oh, thank me for what? That podcast you did with Dad. I said, yeah. We played it the other night at home and we just couldn't believe it. Most of those things we didn't know about him. We didn't know that he went through this and that he overcame that. And he, knows, he doesn't talk about those things. And it just gave us a whole other respect for him. And he came in, Chris, who I interviewed, came in a day or two later and, and he was grateful as well. He said, oh, you know what? I can't tell you what that's that's done for me. It's uh, it's just opened up whole new conversations in the house from my sons. And I thought, well, there you go. That If it only does that. Yes, that's still a win. And, and strengthens relationships with fathers and sons. Fantastic. I did a fellow the other day, Ralph. Ralph's in his 70s, going into his 70s, and he serves Coke at a Coke stand inside the park. And he's been here for 20-odd years. And someone was telling me a little bit about his story and I sat him down and he'd worked in entertainment for many, many years in the 60s, you know, rubbing shoulders with the Rolling Stones and Cliff Richard and he was an announcer and he co-wrote a single that charted in the 60s. Wow. And this guy's life was incredible. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't think to, to, to see him if you walked past him at the stall. Yes. But you sit him down and you open him up and the only problem I had was containing his story because yeah, right. it, was so, it was so expansive and he was going off here and going off there and it just got richer and richer. Mm. And I, my challenge was to contain him. Uh, but he came out of that and just said, oh, you know what, it felt really good just to get all of that out. And now it's a time capsule for his family. Mm. What a great gift. Mm. It sounds interesting too, like in this um, theme park world, like, you know, you've got family members working there, you've got 70 year olds that, you know, you're respecting, um, you know, everybody's playing a role. You've got people that are being, you know, um, climbing up the ranks. So, you know, that, that to me 
spruiks the or at least speaks to the sound of um, great leadership or, or at least a great culture too because you know in a in a world of the great resignation and everything else that seems to be happening um, you know I feel like as an employee in any sort of corporate environment and whilst yours is different um, it does sound like there's a lot of uh, investment on the people within and appreciation for all the different types whether you're a dancer or you're the dude in the in the costume um, what is that culture like is, is that is that something that you I mean because just it doesn't look like you've necessarily tried to stray too far, but you would speak to others from different corporate environments. Like that culture sounds very strong. Yeah, look, I always say you get the culture you deserve. And so if you're not paying attention, the culture you get will be the culture you get. If you're paying attention, then you can hopefully be a, a custodian of a culture that you would like and be a representative of the culture you would like, knowing full well you can't radically transform it on your own. It's every individual but you need to be a guiding force for that. And I think of culture kind of like tending to the garden. You know, it's not enough to get all excited on the weekend and turn over the soil and, you know, do the pruning and cutting back and sit back and go, look at that, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You now need to go back the following week and you do that again. And then you go back and you do it again. And, and it's that old Chinese proverb in some respects too, you know, the, and I'm paraphrasing, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, and after enlightenment, chopping wood and carrying water. <laughs> you know, yeah. once it's arrived and you're aware, the learning is only just beginning. So once the culture is seeming to be healthy, that's just the beginning. Now mm. the challenge is the cultivation and the consistency of that culture. That comes with energy and attention. So, and that's not just one person. That has to be a collective buy-in from the frontline stakeholders right through. So we within our team work very hard on that. Mm. Yeah, well, it sounds like the human connection part that you're seeing doesn't just mean you to customer. It actually sounds like it's throughout the whole business that there, there is an emphasis on human connection, which is, I think, brilliant and really what every business needs. Yeah, now more than ever. Mm. Mm. And so I'm interested to understand from your perspective, what's your definition of success? I can tell you that in a statement, it's peace of mind. Okay. And I think if you can get to a point in your life, regardless of what it is that you're doing or the title that you have and the status that you hold, if you're able to, as Dr. Wayne Dyer once said, you know, get in the gap mm. and just be present and be in the space between competing thought and energy and consistently do that where you are not in your own way and you can maintain a degree of peace within here, for me, that's success. The outer world stuff is a bit of a distraction if you're not careful. You know, I, I have a phrase that people close to me know, and that is, who are you in the dark? So during the day, we're on, we're engaging, we're in the world, and even unconsciously we're making tweaks and adjustments in order to coexist and move through the day. And inevitably you're left with yourself. So when night falls... And this is from someone that for a long time wasn't good at it and wanted to be better at it. Are you still? Can you get to a point at day's end where the person in the mirror is someone you're at peace with for the things that could be better that you're working on and you're honest about and you can lean into the things that you are good about you and you, you're strengthening those things and then with each passing year you're a slightly better version of the person you once were? Mm. Did you find that peace of mind during the authoring of your book? For me, that's success. And I say that from someone who for the longest time didn't understand what peace of mind was and didn't have it and worked hard to seek it out. Mm. So I talk about these things not like it's sort of, you know, it's a nice banner to wave in the air, but to have done the work and to continue to do the work. So it really is for me the greatest sense of success is to be able to be at peace with the person in the mirror on a regular basis. Mm. And if I've seen one thing often enough during my time is that a lot of us have a hard time just having peace of mind on a regular mm. basis. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I went along to a um, a group called Pathway Zen at Sanford, and uh, you know, we you'd sit in the group, and it was all about silent meditation, counting, um, just just sort of getting into a spot where you're just having no thought or just observing thought. Uh, but then at the end of those meetings, I, I think I went into a day of silence, and at, at the end of the day, 
I spoke to some other people and some people would ha- could only sit for an hour. They and and like you would talk to them later about it and they're like, oh no, my mind's just going crazy and I'm too anxious. That's as much as I can take. And I and I felt like that was so interesting to see how different people can get still, different people can't. Like my mind goes fast, but I can also bring myself to a close. Um and but if, you know, you're talking about how you've worked hard to get to that place. Um was there a turning point or was there a, an event where you were like, Oh no, I need to, I need to go and seek it out. Cause you talk about seeking it out and that you didn't have it. Do you remember a point where you're like, nah, time, time's enough for you or you burnt out? Like what, what was the, the catalyst, I suppose? Well, it was the loss of the first marriage at a young age and without taking too long to tell the story and waking up, inevitably then in a single bedroom unit surrounded by boxes, living now in a different state, starting a new job. And it's Christmas day, because I can tell you the day. And it's uh, 1999. And I remember just sort of looking around and my life had been moving so fast up until that point. And I was just, I was the pace of my life moving. I was in the passenger seat rather than behind the wheel and gearing and steering. Mm. So, but I didn't know that at the time, right? The, the, the car had to crumble and I had to crawl out of it before I knew that. Mm. So I can still remember that Christmas day in 1999, looking around and just having this new thought appear that there's one constant in all your suffering here, and that's you. So let's now start to replay the the video of your your life journey back and I would do that I would reflect and I wasn't usually one for reflection and it was a conscious decision on that day to say to myself this will be the first and only Christmas day I do like this so what have I got to do to turn that around well let's start by pointing the finger at everybody else being responsible and look at the guy in the mirror Mm. what could be better when can you start And that was the beginning back in 1999 of starting to replace patterns of thought, patterns of behaviour and reading more, seeking out new knowledge, putting new software in to the hard drive rather than running on old programs that I've been carrying around since I was in my late teens. So I'm grateful for the opportunity that was in that pain to reinvent and reset with still enough time to get the best out of life rather Mm. than to go through that later in life to only go, oh, wait, you know what? This would have been handy 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And look, I think a a smart person learns from their own mistakes and a wise person can learn from their own and the mistakes of others. So, you know, anybody listening can sort of, you know, take away from what you're saying. I got taught once that if you're pointing the finger of blame at somebody else, before you do that, realize that you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself and to try and at least start looking at things in that ratio um, to really sort of work out, well, what can you own? What did, you know, what could you do differently and whatever else? And it sounds like you really did get a level of self self awareness then that that has you know done you a, a lot of good from from then until now. Um, do you feel like um, you know and whether or not it was there before? But do you feel like that having a strong se- a level of self awareness is is one of your strengths? Oh yeah, it's 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 paramount, and it's that transitioning of coming out of ego and and getting into authentic self awareness you know, and cr- trying your hardest to diminish the, the weight of the ego because the ego is easily pleased and loves junk food, mm. you know, and loves, loves a diet of quick hit sugar and is easily pleased and it doesn't require a lot of work, which is why a lot of us will dive into that mode more freely than to move in the other direction, which requires the work, the self-love, the self-awareness, Uh, the self-discipline, that's where the work is. And it's understanding, truly understanding, when am I coming from my authentic self? When am I caught in ego? When you can pick the difference, it's liberating and it's a superpower. It's an absolute superpower. But you don't know that you're able to, to do that until the ego is destroyed enough through circumstance that you can rebuild and come up again. I often say that uh, resilience 
is a muscle trained in the gym of adversity. Mm. So there's it, moving through adversity and moving through the weight of drama, whether it's emotional drama, psychological drama, whatever the circumstance might be, that on the other side of that, if you do the work, the muscle of resilience strengthens. And it's not, it's not an ego strength. It's, a, it's an authentic strength. But, again, it requires the work. It, comes, it all comes back to you, you know. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? We can sit on a rock and keep throwing rocks at those that walk by and pointing fingers and laying blame, or we can get off the rock and start chopping wood and carrying water. <laughs> I love it. And so, like, what else do you think makes up then, from your perspective, the ingredients of your success? Uh, it's just three things. It's preparation, it's presence, and it's resilience. It's, I say preparation because particularly having worked as a professional actor and then worked with other actors for 30 years also outside of the theme parks, that work is all about the prep. It's not about the dialogue. It's not about learning scripts. It's about doing the preparation. What's the motivation in the scene for the character? What do they want? What brought them to that moment? What are they feeling? That requires a lot of work. But that art form I found to be a great tool for real self-development, to ask those same questions of yourself. Um, working as a professional actor is all about, and I guess it's the same in any field, are you doing the preparation? Are you chopping the wood and carrying the water? Be doing that. Whatever it is, be doing the work. Even when the opportunity isn't there for you, be doing the work. So when the opportunity arrives, you're prepared mm. and you can walk in to the opportunity rather than I'll sit back and wait for someone to see my brilliance and to hand me a doorway. And if you haven't been chopping the wood, carrying the water, doing the prep, it's not your day. That's back on you. So there we are again. Preparation. Presence. I often think of the mind like a four-lane freeway. You know, there's this constant traffic. Mm -hmm. And each thought is a vehicle on the freeway. And we, as I'm sure you know, we are observing the thought. We aren't the thoughts. That realisation for me changed my life when I understood I'm not my thoughts. I'm having thoughts. I'm having feelings. I can recognise and regulate emotions if I choose to. I can recognise and choose focus on what thoughts I decide to put attention to. Or I can also choose to slow the thought process down, be still and actively listen and be present with you, be present with a child, be present with an employee, with a friend, with a parent, whatever it might be. Superpower. Most of us have a hard time because we're usually caught up on the freeway not knowing we've got the power to be traffic control. Mm. So preparation, presence. Uh, the last one is resilience. I know that's come up a few times. Not being afraid to move through adversity, not being afraid to move through elements of suffering and understanding that the endurance of doing that, if you're open to it, will transform you, will strengthen you. And all of that can be done through daily practice. All of these three things can be done in da with daily practice. Mm. And those little micro habits on a daily basis in the long term will begin to transform your life. No yeah. doubt about it. I've seen it. Yeah, nice. I, I love the, I love quotes. Absolutely love quotes, pump out a lot of quotes um, for other people. I have, you know, over the years, I've uh, done that a lot. Um, but one of the ones I absolutely love is where lucky people say, oh, you're lucky, but luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And so it sounds like in line with what you're saying. And, and again, even further in line that not only do you have to put the work in, but you have to be present enough to actually see opportunities when they arise, because, you know, sometimes you'll hear people having opportunities in their life, but they're oblivious to the, that, that it's going on because they are caught up in thought. And it, when I first sat in um, with the Zen, I, I didn't know that I was actually hopping on. I, to me, I imagined it similar to the highway, but like a train station, like Grand Central Station. And every thought that would arise, I'd hop on and then I'd have more thoughts and, and each thought was the next station with the, with the next stop. Uh, but re when really I was always at Grand Central and it was just that my mind had left and gone and come back. And eventually you don't actually have to catch the trains at all. You were allowed to let all the trains leave 
and you're just sitting in a quiet train station just by yourself and that's your empty mind space uh it will it was really empowering to to like you say realize that i'm not my thoughts and that i can be the silent observer it does um help like even um i like the idea of reboundability and like you were sort of saying slowing things things down and being still we have this emotional response where we might respond to something very quickly and it might not be the response that we want. We could anger, get frustrated, all those sorts of things. But we then, like the Wayne Dyer getting in the gap, there's a, there's a, there's an event. And if we can be perfect, well, we don't respond badly. We realize there's a gap between event and our response, but sometimes emotion gets the better of us, but then we can choose to react to how we reacted. So even though we might've reacted, we can then change that and then get still and realize that anger, any negative emotion probably isn't going to provide any positivity for us. So then we can get back to being good again. We rebound quickly to feel good. So it sounds like they're skills that, you know, you are in, or have intertwined in your life. Absolutely. And something you were talking about there before, the, I often think that uh, when, when we have a situation, we usually default to the primal response. And if we pause long enough, let the primal, observe the primal desire to react and observe it and then come from the higher response. When you start to get in the habit of that, there's less room for regret. There's less reason to go back and make an apology. You just find you start to get less of those. There is no perfection, right? I think I've even heard you say it. In previous podcasts, you know, we're all perfectly imperfect. I love the fact that humans complicate their own existence. We get lost in the woods in here and we bring all this complexity into our, into our existence. When I think that uh, human beings aren't complicated, we complicate. You know, we love to go in here and, and make it all complex. But if we can feel that primal reaction desire and observe it, and then choose a response rather than have that primal reactivity, already you will start to see aspects of your life begin to shift personally mm. and professionally. And I'm saying this from somebody that was completely unaware of such things and it was always primal reaction, primal reaction, until you get to the point where you've ex you're exhausting yourself and you're improving nothing around you. Mm. but there's got to be another way and there is another way but that requires work attention self-awareness self-reflection getting comfortable with the guy in the mirror being able to be comfortable in the dark when the lights are out be still and if you can get to that point where that peace of mind is there without you having to fight for it and reach for it you're on your way Mm. Are you noticing yourself then at times if if the immediate response might have been um, negative or, or whatever else, or you, you, you know, does your mind still now get to places where you're having darker times? And if so, what is it that you're doing to recognize and then pull yourself out of that? Are you saying something to yourself? Are you doing something in particular? I go back to him a lot because my dad introduced me to his readings when I was 22. So I'm 52 now and I've read most of his works, but then also applied a lot of the thought in the, in the written words of Dr. Wayne Dyer. And the line that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Sounds nice. You can put it on a wall. What does it really mean? I had a moment when my father passed away and I was at his side when it happened just a few hours after his, his birthday and it was a sudden death. And a couple of months later, I turned 50. and I then found myself, I turned 50 in an airport in a regional area of China, waiting to catch a flight to deliver a keynote in the theme park industry at Shanghai. And the flight was delayed for eight hours. And up until that point, I'd been in a hotel room and I had a translator that was assigned to me to help me go about the work I had to do. So that was a really testing time. Hotel room, foreign country, don't speak the language, turning 50 in an airport mm. and the grief of losing your best friend and trying to unpack all that. And I was lost in a cloud of grief. I can tell you when I got to the hotel in Shanghai, I laid out my things and in the stillness, I remembered the line about change the way you look at things. I didn't radically transform myself in that evening, but I did a conscious effort. I sat down and I started writing a project I've been working on ever since. I'm writing a screenplay for the first time. I sat down and I, I got out of my own way and I started writing. 
what I've learned since then was I was beginning to turn grief into gratitude. So I was changing the way that I was looking at things rather than the grief for the loss of that person, rather than the self-absorption of turning 50 and I'm alone and I'm stuck in a hotel room and focusing on the gratitude. I had 50 years with the greatest man I ever knew. 50 years. What a gift. I got to be there and honour him when he left the world and, and stroke his head as he passed. What a gift. I got to turn 50 while I was being asked to deliver a keynote presentation to industry colleagues in another part of the world. What an honour. I'm staying in this nice hotel in a foreign country as their guest. What a gift. So I was applying consciously this idea of shift the things, the way you're looking at these things and focus on them in a unique way. Now, that's not suppression or repressing your feelings. It's actually the opposite. It's, it's facing them, but then also looking at them from a new perspective and seeing them for what they truly are, their gifts mm. to you. Mm. you know? so I hope that answers your question, but I genuinely believe that, that that was a turning point for me also. You get these little tentpole turning points when you start to live long enough, and if you're paying attention, you can recognise them as they're happening rather than constantly hitting the snooze button and sleeping in for another five years. Another yeah. five. Oh gosh, well, I, I just managed to like suck the tears back into my into my eye- eyeballs just then. So for anybody that's not watching that, that actually happened. So they're nearly coming down um, my cheeks because that that's a that's a heavy story and and it's interesting because when you think of life at, when sometimes you know I imagine it like this, it's like a game of Jenga. Do you know like all of the things that were kind of stacking, all of the bricks that were being removed in your in on your birthday. You know, there's a lot of pressure there, a lot of reasons why you know one more little brick. Br- gets pulled out and the whole thing comes crashing down and yet you know it's almost as though you were just sort of again changing the game it's not a game of Jenga and if you if you do bring gratitude and you do change your perspective my partner talks about perspective a lot absolutely love the word Um, and then when you if there was a bell curve and I like that because it's my last name but on a bell curve you know for where you are in your life and, and how you're living you know, if it, like Gary Vee talks about ranking everybody in the world, one to however many billion, you'd be ranked pretty high up. Like you've got a good life. Some kids didn't even get to have a parent and, you know, and whatever else. And if, so by changing that, you know, it, you can see how you can change your perspective and you can look at things and, and to be grateful and, and a celebration of life um, that, that you did get to have. So, wow, that, that, that was an incredibly uh, moving story and, and really does, um, you know, show the character that you have. And obviously, um, if your dad was your best friend, um, do you feel like he played a big part in, in sort of helping to raise you? your parents, helped to raise you kind of like with a lot of this, you know, real genuine, authentic character built in? It's funny, you know, there was a moment I was getting on a train long before the digital age and I was leaving home. I left home at a young age and uh, I was visiting and then getting back on the train to come back down to the Gold Coast from Townsville. And Dad stopped me as I was getting on the train and he handed me a book and he, Dad was a seeker, you know, seeker of knowledge and he handed me this book, Dr. Wayne Dyer, Your Sacred Self. And on the cover of that edition, here's this balding guy with a moustache, I think wearing a woolen vest, leaning against an oak tree and kind of smiling like this, Your Sacred Self. And I tried not to show any kind of reaction to the book to Dad because I could see how excited he was for me to have it. He said, I'm going to give you this have a read of this on the trip back. And I remember looking at the cover thinking, this is the last thing I'm going to read on the on a train trip. <laughs> uh, so, of course, it's pre-digital age. You've got to be present. You're looking out windows. And I've got this book sitting there looking at me. And I started to flick through it, more out of the fact I had nothing else. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute, I was in my early 20s. I wasn't quite ready for what I was taking in, but I was fascinated other parts of my mind were sort of firing. What is this? What's this whole thing about? It's self-realisation. This What? But it kept me reading. I would say it would be another five years before I started to really kind of reflect and draw out and go back. I can tell you now, I've bought that book several times in my life since and I still don't own a copy because it's always gone from me to another. And then someone has said to me, hey, that book has started to transform my thinking, Michael, in my life. Thank you. I'll give it. No, I don't want it back. Mm. I want you to pay it forward. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
I went on to read all of Dyer's works and, and many others that uh, were of his ilk, but I still remember that came from Dad and it was, he was excited for me to have it. So I've, I've, as the years have gone by, I've been excited for others to have it. I almost don't want it. I want it mm. out in the world. You know. Yeah, I think I was about twenty, and I, I think I got um, bought myself like a six or an eight disc. It's never crowded along the extra mile, and you know you're changing the discs out of the, yes. uh, you know the. I think we had a five disc CD player, and you had it wasn't even enough to like I had to like, change the 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 set. Um, but it was really he is a, he is a, a deep thinker. It was sad that he that he died, but gosh, he, just all the way he. Um, you know, I've, I've got audio books, I've got books, I've got that um, getting in the gap meditation, like anybody that hasn't heard Dr. Wayne Dyer, then it's probably worthwhile going and actually searching um, because there's, uh, I think, does he do spiritual solution for every problem that there's a lot of gold um, in, in, and like you said, once you start to ripple out from all the other people, Deepak Chopra or others, um, there is certainly a lot that uh, helps you to open your mind to a point where you may realize that, and it's not to downplay anyone's problems, but just to just to really realize how blessed we are to be alive and that it might as well be a, a thing of beauty and that we should be able to enjoy the now rather than being caught up um, miserable uh, only to potentially get to our deathbed and look back with regret that we wish that we had to really lived this life while we had a chance. Look, I can tell you today, as we're talking, this morning I went and visited a family member who's 87, who's just been put into an aged care facility and I haven't seen her for 30 years just by the way that things have gone. And my mother called and said, do you want to come up? And a part of me for a moment was, do I want to go? I mean, I don't, I haven't seen that person for 30 years. I don't know if I have a connection. I'm so glad I did. And I walked in and, and she, she lit up. And my brother was with me and she lit up. She had complete recognition and of who we were. And she was a wise, a wise old soul. And she said, I, she said something that was interesting. I said, I, I got here, so I looked around. Are they treating you well? Do you like it here? And she looked at me and she said, Michael, I never imagined I would end up here in a place like this, but I'm here and they treat me well. I've had a great life. She was in such a comfortable, steady mindset. And I came away from there just, just enriched and understanding. We talked about how quick life is. And I, my last memories of her were as this independent woman, you know, who, who looked terrific and she was confident and, and strong. And the body wasn't that person laying in the bed today, but the mind and the spirit were absolutely right there, completely aware. And we just talked about the brevity of things. Mm. And I've often thought that that's the, that's the beauty in life. It's not, it's not the tragedy that it's quick. The beauty of it is that it's fast. So let's not spend too much of it caught up in our own heads and not seeing the things that we've been given and not seeing the riches that are laid out for us, even on our darkest times. Mm, absolutely love that. My grandma, my, my great grandma um, is just not long had her 102nd birthday and she's still out oh. like doing bowls and different things, but you know, it is, it is, it is interesting just to, you know, be like my granddad's my best mate. He, he'd be late seventies. Um, and it is so interesting to see that when people have lived their life, I don't think anybody looking back is saying, um, don't try to be happy now. Don't try to do what makes you happy. No one's, no one is saying like, why didn't you go to the office more? Or you should have gone and done X, Y, Z, um, you know, thing that you didn't enjoy because you have to, everybody is really talking about, you get one life, you know, human connection seems to be a big thing that comes up, paying it forward, you know, kindness seems to be a big thing. So, um, you know, again, Wayne Dyer, I think he has, uh, if it was him, talks about the AM and the PM of your life and the rules in the AM of your life, like get more money and riches and some of those things, you know, in the PM of your life, those rules don't really quite mean the same thing. Because, And so if you can learn in the AM, the rules of the PM, and, and, and I guess by that, I'm saying that maybe it is more about connections and, and peace of mind and some of those things that clearly, um, you know, people want to achieve and may not in their lifetime, but, you know, hopefully they do in their lifetime. If you can be cultivating that at whatever age you are now and then carry that forward, surely that's a life that's, you know, lived better than it would have been had you not. Well said. And I often think as a parent, you know, our parents become our stories and we will one day be the stories for our children. And I think, you know, what will be the story they tell? 
when you're not here because you're authoring that story now while you're authoring your own. When my father passed, my eulogy was 20 minutes and I had to cut that in, bring it back. A good friend of mine, when his father passed, I remember him telling me years ago, it was confronting for him because as he sat down to write the eulogy, he realised, I really don't know what to write. I knew him, but I didn't know him. Mm. He was so busy being busy and he was a good man, but I just didn't, couldn't tell you what he loved. I couldn't tell you what motivated him. I know that he was a provider. And this was, I remember hearing that from a fellow that was much older than me at the time and thinking to myself, oh, wow, I, I, I never want to be in that position. Because there was a, obviously for whatever that situation was, there's no, there, was, there seemed to have not been enough presence in that relationship, enough awareness, enough time. So when that inevitability of the passing happens and he gets up to speak, he's coming up with something relatively light because he's not able to go deep. Mm. And I took a lesson out of that. And, um, again, we're authoring those stories for our children, for our loved ones while we're here. So that's something to be aware of as well. That Cats in the Cradle song gets me teary when I hear it. And it really makes me think like I, I want to be present. I don't want, I don't want to, because they learn from us. They, they're constantly watching there. And so I, I make an effort like we're school holidays just now uh, and I have my fi- kids 50% of the time. And so I took the holidays off and I spent pretty well every minute with the kids and like, you know, that might cost me other opportunities. It might cost me other things. I am so happy opportunity cost that it did cost me all those other things because I really realized what matters and they are growing up so fast. And, you know, from these little kids that, you know, I just used to nurse or or give bottles to now they're writing me letters with their alphabet that they've just learned. And and they're asking me maths questions and, you know, and I'm sure soon enough, they'll be asking me for the car keys. Um, And like you said, the brevity of, of everything, like I think it is somehow trying to, not grip onto any moment in particular, but to try to just really enjoy each moment as best you can in, in the chaos of the world. I think that that stillness within yourself and, and knowing what matters is really a great opportunity to be present and to really appreciate what you have. Absolutely. The, the outer world is and has always been largely organised chaos that we bring our intention to and we bring an intention of desire to. I want to get in the car and drive home. I want to safely walk out of this office and and, and go across the the hall, whatever it might be. I want to jump on that plane and fly to that country. The world is largely the sort of bubbling chaos that we're bringing our intention to to move within it. So often it's going to throw things at us and you can't always control what's happening out here. And Dyer talks a lot about this. But you can control what's happening in here. And that's, again, getting getting yourself out of the passenger seat of your life and putting yourself in the driver's seat consciously. It's easier to sit in the passenger seat because you can kind of observe it and look over your shoulder and not take much notice of what's happening behind the wheel. But getting behind the wheel requires attention and a bit of work, but that's where the reward is. And we've had chats, friends and I, about, you know, what's the point of it all? And I think the point of it all is during my time here, am I a slightly improved version of myself with each passing year? And am I passing that knowledge and that wisdom or that awareness onto those around me so that their lives might be better also for having had me in it. Mm. And may they go forward and do the same in spite of what life may throw at them. I don't know if there's anything more than that purpose is that while we're here, are people better for having been in our company or not? And if they're not, what are we doing? Yeah, it's almost like in my mind imagining like a, you know, not that it's a competition, but arriving at the pearly gates, if there is such a thing. Uh, mm-hmm. I think heaven is on earth. Um, what we're living right now, heaven or hell, is, is, is our own mindset, is my personal opinion. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if, if we arrive at the pearly gates and, and maybe it's like a scoreboard, a big scoreboard in the sky, uh, and, you know, what you could have brought yourself, kindness and how you turned up, but the ripple effect, for every ripple effect and every pay it forward, that's extra bonus points where you have lifted somebody else up, you know, whether they're in a dark time or you just made them, you know, a, a human connection or, or entertained them and made their life better, that's helping your scoreboard go up too. And so ultimately, if you get to the end and you can sort of look at your scoreboard, can your hand on heart say that you did your best to be a good person yourself and also be good to those around you? Mm-hmm. It's really that simple. Mm-hmm. And it's, it also comes back to being kind to yourself as well. 
you know, that self-leadership, that self-awareness, that self-regulation. I'm not talking about narcissism. I'm talking about the opposite of that. I'm talking about self-care, self-respect, self-love and nurturing that within yourself. And I realise that when I look back on the journey of my 20s too, I never had a lot of that going on. And it was important to have things removed from your life that you valued in order to confront that. So, you know, I, I spend a lot of time each year working with Rotary and speaking with young kids through a program that is uh, youth in transition. So it's kids coming out of high school and moving to the world. And I'll often say to them at the start each year that I'm with them that I'm going to throw a lot of seeds in the air and some of those are going to take root today. Some may not take root for a little time, but these are the things I know to be true, just as water is wet and the sky is blue, and I'll pass them forward for you. And it's trying to take those big ideas and simplify them down. One thing I found liberating that I talk a lot with young people about is freeing yourself from the idea of success and failure. Free yourself from this fear of failing and this desire for success. Because for me, and you might find this a bit challenging, I don't know, I don't believe either exists. So for me, there's only outcomes. If I do something, something happens. And I talked about that as well. If I do nothing, no thing happens. Now, let's simplify it right down because I'll say to the kids, if you choose to do nothing with this life, which could be a choice you make, that's fine, then expect that universe and kind will meet you there and no thing shall happen. Mm. Or you can do something and every single time you do something, there'll be an outcome. There's only ever outcomes. Failure and success are the labels we stick on an outcome. It's either an outcome of intended desire or it's an outcome that takes you by surprise. And in the outcome that takes you by surprise, education and learning. Not necessarily easy, can be emotional, can be a physical learning, whatever it might be, but it's an outcome nonetheless. And I found when I liberated myself from this idea of being afraid to fail, when I realised there is no failure, there's only an outcome. It's for others to stick the label on, for others to say, oh, look at you, look how successful you are. Mm. For me, it's a piece of death the second I start to think I might believe my own press and measure these things as being that when they really are only the outcomes of an intention that happened to be in my favour by chopping wood and carrying water and doing the preparation. No, I like so, that because everything just is, isn't it? Really, everything just is. And then that's the, one of the things they first things the Zen master was teaching us was everything just is language and all these things that we try to label it. That's not what it is. It's not a chair. That's just, it, it, it just is. And then labels and we, that's when things start to divide. Everything is just one. And so, you know, I, I really like that. I can see how that's liberating because I don't have to then chase success or I don't have to be crippled by failure. I can just see the outcomes for what they are, learn from those and then decide which path I want to take moving forward. I've been blessed in, in my life. There's nothing that I have wanted to do or see that hasn't happened or I haven't done. Now, that's not ego. That's just being doing the prep, setting a focus, having an intention and moving toward it. I've had my share of pain and the negative on the other side, but I've also, I would like to think, grown up through that as well and developed resilience. Again, we're not a complex animal, but we like to complicate and I look back at the journey of my life and think, well, there's a theme there of a fearlessness about, around outcome, not being worried about failing or succeeding and understanding, I just want to move in that direction and see what happens because I know something will happen. And that's liberating. Mm -hmm. Absolute gold throughout this whole chat. I'm impressed. Is there any other like tips that you would get for give for someone that's like wanting to achieve more success in their life, whether they're feeling stuck or they're just wanting to achieve greater levels of success? You know, we've talked about a lot already, but is there anything else that you think that you would add into the mix? Stop talking, start doing. Find a tribe. Seek out knowledge through others that share similar passion. You can overthink yourself into immobilization. I'm not good enough, I'm not talented enough. That thing that someone said to me when I was 15 in high school, I've never forgotten, and that defines me. Noise, 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 noise. I often say, and I'll try and answer your question succinctly, with, don't give up your birthright because your birthright is you were born fearless, not fear-filled. So none of us come into the world filled with fear about being in the world. 
When you talk to children, you hear it in them. They tell you, I'm going to be a president, I'm going to be a prime minister, I'll be a doctor, I'll be a racing car driver. Big, big dreams. What happens is then we learn fear, we learn self-doubt, we start to get this looped self-talk going on. We find out that people aren't always what they, they seem. We get our hearts broken. We fall in love. We fall out of love. Noise, 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 noise. I call it inner fire. Everyone's born with inner fire. The passion to drive your purpose. We've all got it. Even if you don't right now know what it is, you have it in you. It's a question of getting present and paying attention and then realising there's no failure, there's no success, there's only an outcome. Get out of your own way. Tap into that. Passion fuels purpose. So find the thing that you're passionate about. It'll drive the purpose and push you through the obstacles that you're going to get. Or don't do that and walk a path for another and find that there's still obstacles, but you'll have no passion to push through them and it'll be a life far from unfulfilling or far from fulfilling. So for me, I say to the kids when I'm with them during the Rotary sessions particularly, don't give up your birthright, no matter how much the world demands that you should because you were born fearless. That's how we come into the world. That's why the species has gone on like it has. We're born fearless. That's why we dream big. We learn fear. We learn self-doubt. We learn anxiety. But we make a decision to bring in those things and own them if, we, if we're going to do that. I think it was Gandhi that once said, I'm going to loosely paraphrase this, no one soils the hallways of my mind with their dirty feet. Essentially saying, for me, I choose what comes in. I choose who takes up room space. I choose the focus of where I'm going to put my attention. I don't just let it all in to take command of me. Mm. I choose. So it's an easy thing to surrender. You surrender it in parts over a lifetime without knowing you're surrendering it. Absolutely love that. Absolutely love that. Don't don't surrender your birthright. Like, just uh, hang my hat on that um, excellent um, point as as we sort of coming towards the close here. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to have this chat um, and for for all the gold the gold that you've that you've shared that is that is Michael Croker and 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 your your thoughts. Um, for anyone that wanted to follow along on the journey, is there like any you know best ways for them to to follow along and see what you're up to and social media handles, websites, anything like that? Look, I, I'm obviously I'm on LinkedIn at, as we talked at Michael Croker. I'm at uh, Instagram on Mike underscore Croker. And my website is standanddelivercoach.com where you'll find a little bit more about what I'm about and my background and what the offers are around uh, communication coaching. And the um, Park Life podcast available where all good podcasts uh, are listened to? Very good. Yeah, I think particularly I'm on the Apple and Spotify platforms and there's about 26 episodes there and some new ones coming up. So they're a bit of fun as well. We use the theme parks to tell the stories about life nice nice well look again thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat michael an honor tom and keep up the great work that you're doing with everything i think it's wonderful stuff and i'm proud to have been a small part of it appreciate that so much and for everybody listening or, or tuned in for another episode thank you so much for coming along if you could like comment share tell a friend um, all of that wonderful stuff um, i really appreciate you, you being here and listening um, but i'm tom bell and i'll catch you on the next episode